as a political issue in, in California, uh, particularly during the, the 80s, um, and as, the, as people started coming for various reasons uh, from Mexico, the population increased, uh, and the debate started getting also very similar to the way it is today, very toxic, very, um, very caustic, as people started to feel, frankly, afraid. They saw their neighborhoods changing. They saw signs going up in Spanish. I'm telling you stuff that should be familiar. There's been quite an influx of Spanish-speaking people here. Um, and that, for many people, can be disorienting. I remember one woman saying, when I saw the billboards starting to uh, go up in Spanish, Spanish language, I realized that was time for me to leave. And so what started happening in Los Angeles was, was a phenomenon they called white flight, where areas that had been affected by, you know, by migrants, uh, many white people just abandoned them and, and, and moved to the suburb. Um, but as all this was happening, and as the debate started increasing uh, in, in California, the response both in California and nationally became fairly extreme. And it, at, the, at the national level, Clinton, the president at the time, uh, started to militarize the border. Militarize the border by sending troops, uh, essentially, border patrol, uh, first to Texas, um, and, then to, uh, and then to California. Um, and uh, with Operation Gatekeeper and Operation Hold the Line. Operation Hold the Line in California, Operation Gatekeeper in, in, in California. And um, this, was, this, this was followed by, by NAFTA. But what it, the idea of sending troops to Mexico, when I say troops, I'm talking about the Border Patrol, and putting up fences, uh, was to essentially drive migrants from Mexico through Arizona. Um, that was the intent. Because they, they kind of figured that Arizona, a more inhospitable place to cross, people would just wouldn't go there. <coughs> so it didn't work. Why didn't it work? Because you can't change immigration patterns simply by putting up fences and having, I mean, you can to a certain extent. And it certainly people, many people, who, who the, the less hardy, I'm sure, didn't come. Uh, but the more hardy did. Um, and uh, they came through Arizona. Um, fast forward and we can see the results of what happened when, when so many people came through Arizona. But they didn't change the reasons, the conditions, that led people to migrate in the first place. And that is, I think, what, that's the big lesson, that's the big takeaway. There was the pull, there was the attraction of jobs in Arizona and elsewhere. People needed low-wage workers, and the economy was crap in, in, uh, in Mexico, and that was, that was pushing people out. So you had the two conditions you really need for migration, and that's the, the push and the pull factors, unaltered by the militarization of the border, so people kept coming. In fact, that was one of the commercials that one of the politicians at the time running for re-election, Pete Wilson, the governor of California, put up as one of his themes, they keep coming, and it really, in that black and white footage of people coming, and he was right. Um, in, in, in a way, he was right. They did keep coming, because why not? There were jobs available, and people make the personal calculation that if, if the situation is going to be better where they're going than where they're coming from, they're going to do it. But that, again, ignores the reasons that, that people do it. Um, so I started as a journalist uh, getting a little frustrated with some of the stories I was being asked to do. Uh, I would be telling the same stories over and over again, and I think that that's what you see now, is do immigrants cost us more than they, than they contribute? Should they have driver's licenses? What about immigrants on welfare? And on and on and on and on. And there's only so much I, I could write about this stuff. Um, and I decided, my editors luckily, uh, thankfully, agreed to send me down to central Mexico to try to tell a story about what it was that was motivating people. And what we did was we followed a family from uh, California 
who went back to Mexico on a holiday uh, to visit relatives. And we kind of told the story of this family. And as I started doing that, um, it was a real eye-opener and, and really led, in a way, to writing the book many years later. Because what we saw uh, was when we went back to this little village where some of these people who were living in Los Angeles came from, um, we started asking about migration and migration in the family. And it turned out that just about everyone, most of the people living in the village were women because most of the men, uh, the young men, had, had gone abroad. Uh, we got there uh, to give you an example, an illustration of how important migration was on El Dia de los Ascentes. My Spanish is not very good. But the Day of the Absent Ones. I mean, immigration was such a big deal that they had a whole day, a day, a special day, to celebrate what migrants were able to do for the economy of this place. So then we started asking questions. Well, how much do you know about migration? And everyone, just about everyone I think we spoke to, had connect, could connect their own family to a long history of migration. Spoke to the women who said, oh yeah, my uncles, and my, uh, my uncles, my grandfather, my father in some cases, he was bracero. He came over in the 40s and 50s as a migrant worker from Mexico um, as part of a bi-national program worked out between the US and Mexico. Go back further than that. Um, and, and some of them had, uh, had relatives who migrated during World War I uh, when there was a shortage of workers in the fields in, in the United States because the Doughboys had gone out to fight the war, World War I, the Great War, war to end all wars. Um, and they, they, they brought Mexicans there too, then too. Go back even before then, uh, go to the uh, early 1900s. That was when the railroad networks were completed between Mexico and the United States. A network in Mexico, a network in the United States, um, and linked with the express purpose of bringing agricultural workers, or workers, I should say, not just agricultural workers, into the United States from Mexico. Um, and Mexico and Mexicans were happy to oblige. There was, a, again, a lousy economy in, in, in Mexico. The United States was open um, with agriculture, with the railroads, with the mines, and Mexicans were welcome. So in one little village, you had this long tradition of, of migration. Migration that had a cause, that had a root. And I would suggest that migration continues to have uh, very similar roots, just as migration is, a, is, is almost a form of, of, um, uh, of, of instinct. Uh, we are a, migra a migratory species. Uh, it, it's as natural, I believe, even though we try to cap it and put all these artificial limits on migration, it's as natural to, to us as it was to little creatures who slithered out of bogs in the primordial days looking for better food and shelter. We essentially do the same thing. So if the opportunity is there, and, if, and as we calculate the risks, we're going to go for it, and, and, and we do. Um, migration follows trade routes, the history of migration. When you go back into history and explain how migration was used, uh, people follow trade routes. Um, when industry is necessary, when workers are necessarily, they either go voluntarily or they are seized as slaves. Slaves uh, in, uh, historically have been among the, the, the largest group of, we don't think of them in these terms, but if you think about it, it's true, of migrant workers. Um, they were seized by occupying forces and used. That's why the Romans took slaves. That's why the United States took slaves. We needed people for, for, for industry. So, as, so global expansion requires workers. We can't do it without them. And we always debate mobility um, and control and want to control who moves where and why. Um, the Declaration of, of Independence of the United States has one of the articles is talks about the ability to move. Um, 
talks about the ability to go beyond the borders set by the king. Uh, so if you want to talk about a migrant rights movement, you can go back to the colonists and see the first migrant rights movement in, in the United States. Go back to industrialization in Europe and you see the same kinds of debates taking place about mobility. Who controls how people move? The landed elites in Germany at the, in, in, during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution wanted to keep the serfs on the farm. They needed their labor. Yet at the same time, you have the burgeoning of uh, industry and factories um, and with stiff rules about migration. So who won out? I think we know the industrialists won out and secured the freedom, if you will, of migrants to be able to, to leave those farms and go to the factory. They and they wanted as many as possible. That's also the history of migration. Industry capital wants as many workers as possible to, to compete among the jobs, to, to drive wages down, all the same kinds of stuff that Ron's been writing about for years about high-tech workers coming into the United States. Why would Microsoft and other companies put in applications to bring in more highly skilled workers on H-1B visas at the very same time they're laying people off? That's the reason. That's it. Um, uh, as migrants come, as migrants move, people have been naturally resentful about where they're coming from and what intentions they have. Um, and resentful, as I say, about the, about the other. Uh, the, the very famous example is Benjamin Franklin, who worried about uh, the Germans moving into Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, taking over as contracts were written in German and, and debates were held in German and signs were going up in German. And he, he wrote famously that soon this problem is going to be so out of hand that we'll need interpreters uh, in the uh, Pennsylvania legislature. So one half of the legislature could, could hear what, understand what the other half were, was saying. So this, this idea, this resentment, this fear of, of the other of migrants is, is, is nothing, nothing new. But it increases the fear and the, our reaction to migrants depending on the economy. Uh, the very first law that was specifically written uh, about a racial group was the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, which was written and went into effect in 1862. Um, and up until that point, the Chinese who had settled and had been brought over uh, by industrialists uh, and by farmers to work in the fields and on the railroads um, were accepted and were a needed part of American expansion uh, until the economy started pulling back. And there were riots. There were riots uh, mostly around uh, on the West Coast where the Chinese were concentrated. Riots in um, Washington State, in California State, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, um, under the slogan, the Chinese must go. Um, and it was ugly. And eventually the, the, the ugliness and the political rhetoric resulted in, in the law that was passed to keep out Chinese, to exclude Chinese laborers with the idea that they were taking jobs away from, from Americans. Um, but America, the United States, has, has 